Okay, guys, let's uh, continue on with the parametric equation practice. Uh, this first one, really not that difficult. You could probably handle this just fine, but I figured I'd throw it in here. Uh, talking about a trig example, x is 3 sine of theta minus 4, y is 7 cosine of theta plus 2. Nothing out of the ordinary, really, so when it comes to making my tables, I'll typically pick the quadrantal values just to, you know, get around the circle and kind of hitting those key spots. So 0, pi over 2, pi, 3 pi over 2, and 2 pi. And let's get those x and y coordinates. Uh, x will be 3 sine of 0 minus 4. Sine of 0 is 0, minus 4, negative 4. Pi over 2. Sine of pi over 2 is 1, times 3 is 3, 3 minus 4, negative 1. Plugging in pi gives you, again, 0, minus 4. 3 pi over 2 will give you negative 1, times 3, negative 3, minus 4, negative 7. And plugging in 2 pi, sine of 2 pi, 0, so 0 minus 4 gives us that familiar number again. Uh, for our y coordinate, cosine of 0, just be careful, cosine of 0 is positive 1 times 7 plus 2, it's going to give you 9. At the pi over 2's, cosine is always 0, so that's just going to be 0 plus 2, 2. At pi, cosine is negative 1, so negative 7 plus 2, negative 5. 3 pi over 2, again, is 0 plus 2, 2. 2 pi, right back to 1, 7 plus 2, 9. Plot these points. Really shouldn't be a big surprise if, if you've uh, done the homework here. Negative 4, positive 9. Negative 1, positive 2 negative 4, negative 5, negative 7, 2, and then back to the negative 4, 9. So we've got ourselves a classic ellipse here. Do your best to connect these points and you know. And let's include those directional arrows to show this one was going uh, clockwise. In the rectangular form, you might say, hey, I know the equation of an ellipse. If I see it, I can write the equation just fine. If you want to use the identity uh, form we've been doing, that's cool too. So x is 3 sine of theta minus 4. And again, I'm just going to solve for sine of theta. So that would be x plus 4 and then divided by 3 is sine of theta, right? We would add 4 first and then divide by 3. Our y relationship is 7 cosine of theta plus 2. So again, in solving for cosine of theta, I would subtract 2 and then divide that quantity by 7. So y minus 2 all divided by 7 is cosine. And I'm leaving it as that uh, one big fraction because I'm going to be plugging into that classic Pythagorean identity of sine squared plus cosine squared is equal to 1. Take out sine, take out the cosine, and replace. Sine is x plus 4 over 3. Cosine is y minus 2 over 7. And I am going to slightly simplify this just to make it look like uh, the standard form of an ellipse that we've come to know and love. I'm going to leave that x plus 4 quantity squared, but I'm going to square that denominator. 3 squared is 9, and now it should really be looking familiar to you. y minus 2 squared all over 7 squared is 49 equals 1. And that should be uh, looking good to everybody that we've got an ellipse. The bigger number is under the y quantity, so that is vertically stretched. The square root of 49 is that 7, and that's sort of that you know big radius or half of the major axis. And the center, notice, 
is at negative 4, positive 2, right? The negative 4, positive 2, those opposite values in there. And so there we go. Rectangular form, x plus 4 squared all over 9 plus quantity y minus 2 squared over 49 equals 1. And the question of this special restrictions, did any restrictions come about or did I get the full ellipse? I got the full ellipse, so I don't need to provide any additional restrictions. If you do, because I, I do that sometimes in homework, if, if you get tripped up by what we mean by that, if you were to write the domain of this and the range of it, I, I certainly wouldn't take off. You know, It's this equation, and x is always between negative 7 and negative 1, and y is always between negative 5 and 9. But that's really just what would be the case if I asked you to graph this. So nothing special needed. OK, this one I did want to look at. This number 2, it has a little bit of a, a different feel to it, because notice x and y are both in terms of cosine. And one of them is just cosine, but the other is cosine of 2 theta. <clears throat> uh, so I'm going to approach that pretty much the same way, but I'm gonna, gonna modify a little bit here. In my chart, because that inside of that one quantity is getting multiplied by 2, you might remember that that affects the period of the trig function period is normally 2 pi, meaning it takes 2 pi you know, radians to go through one complete cycle. But with that 2 theta, now it, it will be 2 pi divided by 2. Now it will only take pi units to go through that cycle. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to leave a little space in my table. You know what they say about space, you got to plan it. So I'm going to plan my table here a little bit. I'm going to leave a little space, pi over 2, pi, 3 pi over 2, 2 pi, because I might want to plug in some additional values in between. And you can always do that afterwards, too. Um, if I plug into my x, which is cosine of 2 theta, remember your order of operations. You're multiplying theta by 2 before you take the cosine of it. So plugging in 0, 2 times 0 is 0. Cosine of 0 is 1. Pi over 2 gets multiplied by 2 and makes pi, and the cosine of pi is negative 1. Plugging in pi gives you 2 pi again, and that is 1. 3 pi over 2 again gets multiplied by 2 and makes 3 pi, and that is the same thing as going pi, right? That's coterminal with pi, so that is again negative 1. And 2 pi, you may have guessed, it's like, oh, the same thing as going 4 pi, that's coterminal. Uh, it puts you in the same spot, it's just going to be positive 1. What you might feel you missed out on, though, because you were multiplying by 2, you kind of missed out on those pi over 2 values. Uh, so here's where you might like to say, well, why don't I plug in pi over 4? Because now when I plug in pi over 4, I will get the cosine of pi over 2 after you multiply pi over 4 by 2. And the cosine of pi over 2 is 0. If you plug in 3 pi over 4, 3 pi over 4 times 2 is 3 pi over 2, and the cosine of that is Zero. I mean, right there, that might be enough to get at least your sort of 1, 0, negative 1. You might remember we call that the increment in our class when we adjust the period. Whatever you want to call it, but um, it's just trying to get a better sampling. Uh, plugging these in here to y is just cosine of 0. Cosine of 0 is 1. If you wanted to pi over 4, cosine of pi over 4 is root 2 over 2. Pi over 2, that's 0. 3 pi over 4, that's root 2 over 2, but you're in quadrant 2 where cosine is negative, so you get negative root 2 over 2. Pi, negative 1. 3 pi over 2, a cosine of 3 pi over 2, that's 0. 2 pi, that's positive 1. 
let's plot these points and see if we have enough to see what's going on. If not, I'll, I can always plot more. Uh, 1, 1 was the first point I got. 1, 1. 0, root 2 over 2. 0, root 2 over 2. Root 2 is about 1.4, right? Something like that. And then divided by 2, it's a little bit more than a half. So you're right about there. Negative 1, 0. 0, negative root 2 over 2. So about that same distance, but down the y-axis. 1, negative 1. And then you'll notice that it goes back to negative 1, 0. 1, back to 1, 1. If you were to plug in a, a pi over a 5 pi over 4, you know, to get another value in here, you're going to get 0 for x, and you're going to get negative root 2 over 2. So it goes right back to there. So that's what we're looking at. We've got that shape, and it's one of those partial shapes. The thing is, is that a piece of an ellipse? Uh, what is that? Is that a piece of a parabola? Is that a piece of a hyperbola? And so let's change this thing to rectangular form to give us a little more confidence in what we're looking at. Here's what makes this one so fun. I've got y is cosine of theta already. Beautiful. And I'm looking to plug into that classic identity sine squared plus cosine squared is 1. But with that cosine of 2 theta, how does that fit in into this? Well, hey, you might be having a, a flash that we had identities for that. That was a cosine double angle. And a cosine double angle had three variations, right? The cosine double angle had those three variations, which you can look up. I don't expect you to have them all memorized right off the top of your head. But one of the variations was 2 cosine squared minus 1. The other was uh, cosine squared minus sine squared. And the other was 1 minus 2 sine squared. And they were all equivalent just by substituting in little variations of this Pythagorean. So since y is going to be my cosine of theta, I'm going to plug that right in there. I'm really looking for replacing into this so that this is kind of represented. So that's why I'm going to choose to use this variation of 1 minus 2 sine squared. And then, again, I'm not going to take the square root. I'm just going to solve for sine squared. So that will be x uh, minus 1 equals negative 2 sine squared. And dividing by negative 2, we'll really just switch those signs around. You could leave it negative 2 if you like. but um, <clears throat> So you'll have 1 minus x over 2, or negative x plus 1 if you prefer. And now, when I go and substitute that in for sine squared, look what you get. 1 minus x over 2 plus cosine is y, so this will just be y squared equals 1. You've got yourself uh, a, an equation where y is squared, but x is not. That is a sideways parabola. So you're looking at a portion of a sideways parabola. You could leave the equation like that if you want to make it look more like standard form, maybe you isolate the x. Um, that would be 1 minus y squared. We'll multiply everything by 2. Solve for x. So in other words, just do a little maneuvering here, subtracting 1, dividing by negative 1, however you like to visualize it. So that'll be 1, and I divide by negative 1, get negative 1. And divide my negative 1 will make that positive 2y squared. There's your sideways parabola with its vertex at negative 1, 0. Nothing added or subtracted to the inside there. So that should make sense. Negative 1, 0, there's our vertex. It's opening to the right because that coefficient of the quadratic term is positive. But do we have special restrictions? Yes, because if I were to graph this, I would be graphing a full sideways parabola. So I want to graph this, but I only want to graph it for certain values. Now, if you want to restrict the y value because it's you know, defined in terms of y as opposed to the other way around where we like seeing these, 
you could just say this is uh, this function, but only for y values that are between negative 1 and 1. I never get a y value bigger or less than that, so you could use inequalities, you could use interval notation, or if you did want to restrict the x values because you're thinking x is domain, I would certainly be okay with that, and x actually also has the same restrictions. If you want to include both just because you feel safer, you got all your bases covered, totally fine. The only thing I didn't have on this was the uh, arrows. This is one of those where we started here and we went in this direction, but it actually went back, so you really could have arrows going either way. And again, if you change your uh, graphing calculator to parametric form, you put these equations in, you better, of course, be in radian mode. And if I go to hit graph, you see it, it, went, it went like that, went back and forth. You change your window if you want to see it again. This tells you the t values. I started with 0, and I went all the way to 2 pi. If you want to graph it, see why it did that? And it just it goes like this, and then it darkens as it goes back and forth. So you're good to go. There it is. Cool. Lovely. Okay, guys, good luck. Hope you're getting the hang of these. If you have any questions, of course, just ask.